Let's talk about the elephant in the room, shall we? The Hulk. My cousin Bruce. Semantics, he was of the Hulk, wasn't he? You know, I, I tried to kill him. Welcome back everyone, this will be my full Marvel She-Hulk episode 2 video. There were a whole bunch of easter eggs and references so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. I will be doing videos for all the She-Hulk episodes and we're doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and post your favorite easter egg from the episode on the video. Careful for spoilers, if you haven't seen the episode yet, we'll just start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot talking about WTF moments and easter eggs as we go along. Starting with the episode title, it was called Superhuman Law. It was a reference to the superhero law division of the GLK and H law firm that she is now running as the She-Hulk character. And her first case is to win parole for the abomination and help him get out of prison. They made all kinds of jokes about Marvel in general, like they made fun of themselves, but also broke the fourth wall a ton just because that's kind of the tone of the series making many references to the Incredible Hulk movie and making fun of the fact that they've recast the Hulk as a completely different person, Mark Ruffalo, becoming the character during the Avengers movie after Edward Norton in The Incredible Hulk. That fight was so many years ago, I'm a completely different person now, literally. <laughs> the full name of the law firm is actually a direct reference to some of the creators of Marvel Comics itself. It's Goodman, Lieber, Kurtzman, and Holloway. But the other names are for Martin Goodman, who owned the original company that became Marvel Comics, Stanley Lieber, who was Stan Lee's birth name, he changed it later in life, and Jack Kurtzman was Jack Kirby's original birth name. You also notice when she's walking through the law firm, there are some super meta references to actual physical comic books. So the law firm itself is right out of the She-Hulk comics, like she works there in the comics as well. But in the comics, and now on the TV show too, they're doing it because you see it in the background of their offices, the lawyers at the law firm use in-universe canon comic books to help defend on the superhero cases. I guess that kind of makes Marvel Comics canon inside the MCU, like there is a real company called Marvel Comics creating comic books based on all these heroes. There are a lot of references to the Avengers characters through the episode, like in the world now, post-Avengers Endgame, they're all celebrities, so it makes sense that there'd be a lot of pop culture stuff going on around their characters, a lot of people selling merch based on their characters, and in-universe comic books being created about them. The actual episode begins with a bunch of news broadcasts from different stations in Los Angeles talking about what happened at her trial at the end of episode one with things going crazy and her becoming She-Hulk. One of the funny things too is that Titania's lawyers are apparently blaming the incident on her having low blood sugar. The actress who plays Titania said that she's not coming back till episode five so there might be some loose references to what happened during that episode but she herself will not be back for several episodes. And it's one of the last broadcasters here for KZYO who gives her the She-Hulk name from the comics for the first time. The person walking out of the courtroom could be a comic book creator cameo too. There were a couple references in the episode to comic book creators. We find at the lawyer bar that they all hang out after work is called Legal Ease. It's a joke about the language of lawyers as they speak quote unquote legalese. She hates the name initially. They even make fun of it. Like that's a stupid name. It's super derivative. And it's a bit of a meta joke about them actually doing that in real life. Like back in the 60s, it happened all the time. Like you have a bunch of derivative names where there'd be female characters inside popular titles like Superman, Batman, all the Avengers comics. And to create female superheroes, a lot of them just became derivative versions of the more popular male versions of the superheroes. One of the exceptions though is like the Wasp. So like for instance, the Wasp is an original Avenger in the comics and she's not called Lady Ant-Man or like she Ant-Man or anything like that. She's called Wasp. She has a completely different persona. She breaks the fourth wall for the first time in the episode, agreeing to give the people what they want. Like they're all cheering for She-Hulk. She's become this big celebrity. She's like, okay, fine, I'll be She-Hulk. One of the other funny meta things now too is she jokes about having all these student loans from law school, but literally yesterday as I'm posting this video, the US president forgave a lot of student debt in America. They make a bunch of direct jokes about the Avengers saying that they're mostly billionaires, narcissists, adult orphans, which is funny because obviously billionaires, mostly an Iron Man reference, but narcissists and adult orphans could describe most of the Avengers. I wouldn't call Black Widow a narcissist though, but most of them are adult orphans, like most of their parents are dead. They also make a funny callback to that Falcon and Winter Soldier joke about him not getting paid like he couldn't get a bank loan because he didn't have any income to show. Maternity leave, a pension, are they even paid? We found out the Gamma affects her a little bit differently from the Bruce Banner Hulk. So when she changes back to She-Hulk as she's getting fired by her district attorney boss, we find out the Gamma doesn't metabolize the alcohol in her system the same way so she gets super drunk the minute she changes back. But if you remember in episode one, Bruce Banner Hulk said that the gamma abilities inside him were healing his arm slowly, that was happening slowly, but they were still healing him while he was still in human form. So the gamma was still active in his body. 
Some of you also predicted that she would get fired because the jury would be biased against her because she saved their life. And that is the reason in the episode that they explain she gets fired. And they use that for like a funny montage later where she tries to get hired by other law firms and they're like, no, 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 you're too much of a liability here. The joke about her being hired by G, L, K, and H for the superhero law division, they also pay off later where he's like, yeah, I don't care about all those conflicts. I don't care about those people. Just tell Bob we're moving him to the frozen north, like just to be sadistic. Just tell him that. It's meant to be a joke about how her boss is just as bad as a lot of these supervillains, even if he doesn't himself have superpowers. Like a joke about lawyers being really terrible people. They also have a brand new She-Hulk theme song with the She-Hulk attorney at law titles and they even have like a special little joke where they almost break the fourth wall like it's not a technical fourth wall break but it's close to it like it's kind of a meta where the titles change the text to attorney for hire because she literally just got fired like referencing what just happened in the episode. The show references itself several times during the actual episode like it's just that kind of show. It'd be the same thing if Deadpool had his own TV show. We get a couple Hulk cameo scenes during the episode from Bruce Banner, one to just see how she's doing and then joke about what happens in the episode with her taking the job with Abomination in the history between them and kind of making fun of Marvel in general in the whole recasting thing with Edward Norton being fired and then Mark Ruffalo being hired for the Avengers movie. Also revealing that he is now off planet on that Sakaar spaceship going back to Sakaar to find out about quote unquote something like I'll be busy for a while. He doesn't say exactly what it is. But they did see that particular scene would tie into future Marvel movies, so it is meant to be like a big movie thing that they'll pay off in the future. The only space-based movies that we know about right now are Guardians of the Galaxy 3, the Marvel's movie, Captain Marvel 2, and like maybe Avengers 5 and Avengers 6 Secret Wars. And I don't think that he's going to be in the Marvel's movie, and I don't think that he's going to be in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. So either it's going to be like an Avengers 5 Kang Dynasty reference or it'll be something that they reference at the end of the episode and it'll tie back in with what's happening in Captain America 4, New World Order, or the Thunderbolts movie. I talked about how this could have something to do with the Planet Hulk storyline. They could be circling back around and doing some Scar Son of Hulk storyline and it could lead up to a World War Hulk storyline eventually. But you can let me know in the comments, like why do you think that he is going back to Sakaar now and what is this going to tie in with in the movies? Then on the internet page that she's staring at, there are a ton of Easter eggs all over the place. So there's a Wolverine Easter egg. That was actually really cool. Right underneath the Iron Man reference, man fights with metal claws in bar brawl. That is literally the scene from the first X-Men movie in the bar. If you're not a big comic book reader, Wolverine as a character also debuted in the comics for the first time during Incredible Hulk number 181. So it would be really cool if they debuted a new MCU version of the Wolverine inside a Hulk project. Really want to see that Wolverine versus Hulk in the MCU at some point. Whichever version of Wolverine they want to use, whether or not Hugh Jackman wants to come back for that. There's also finally, finally a reference to that giant stone celestial Tiamat in the Indian Ocean. First reference in a new Marvel project, movie, or TV show since the Eternals movie came out. Like, that's how long it's been. Everybody's been joking about this forever. Like, when are they finally going to reference that in a new Marvel project? Well, they just did. There's references to Ant-Man, Thor, the Avengers. Like, find Ant-Man. I think this is meant to be a game like Where's Waldo? Finding Ant-Man in large crowd shots because he's super tiny. Norse mythology for Thor, new Asgard. There's also a dedicated tab just for news about the Avengers. There's also a new QR code here that points you to the She-Hulk landing page on Marvel.com and gives you a free copy of She-Hulk number one in 2004. They actually did the same thing in episode one, giving you a free copy of the original first She-Hulk appearance in Savage She-Hulk. So I'm expecting them to do this in every single episode where you get like a QR code with a free new comic book in every episode. Because they did the same thing in the Moon Knight episodes, they'll probably do this in a lot of the future Marvel Disney Plus series too with QR codes in the background. The whole thing with the Swiss village might be a reference to Arnim Zola because he was Swiss. It's not a Latveria or Dr. Doom reference because that's in Eastern Europe. And when her mom texts her about their family dinner, zoom and enhance, you notice that her lock screen on her phone is literally Captain America's ass. That is America's ass. When she goes to her parents' house, the number on the house 663 might be a reference to Amazing Spider-Man 663, which featured She-Hulk. It also featured the Avengers and the Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four debuting at the beginning of Marvel Phase 6 pretty soon. If her father looks familiar, that's because he's being played by Mark Lynn Baker from Perfect Strangers. During the dinner, they also joke about being strangers. 
we finally find out what's going on with the Ched character who they mentioned in episode one. He's her cousin and they made it seem during episode one like he was also a genius in the family, but they could have just been joking about it because it seems kind of like a dumbass during the episode. Like they make a big deal about how he's a manager at Best Buy and he's a really big deal because of that. When the mother mentions the Yusuf person at their local coffee shop who wants to be a superhero, that's not the same person as Kamala Khan's father. His name is also Yusuf, but they live in Jersey City on the other side of the country. So this is like a completely different person. Her father makes a whole bunch of Hawkeye jokes asking what he does with all of his arrows. Obviously she doesn't know, but we literally just saw that during the Hawkeye series. They answer that question because Kate Bishop also asked the question. Turns out he in fact does go back and pick up the trick arrows just like her father guessed. Like does he go back and pick them up? Seems kind of dangerous to leave those lying around. Ched makes a reference to Avengers Endgame and the Hulk's Infinity Gauntlet snap when saying that he saved billions of people with the snap of his fingers. She references Eternity when talking to her father about becoming She-Hulk, which we literally just saw the cosmic concept in Thor Love and Thunder. Eternity is one of the most powerful cosmic concepts. It's literally the embodiment of the entire MCU universe. That's why its body looks like it's made up of all the stars because it literally encompasses the entire universe. It just anthropomorphized in this human looking shape. Her father makes more jokes about the events of the Incredible Hulk movie saying that she's not the first Hulk in the family and she did not destroy a city. There's several references to Incredible Hulk during the episode, which they also reference later during the abomination scene about destroying most of Harlem. When she says she feels like a weight has been lifted, metaphorically she's making more of an existential reference about how this weight has been lifted off of her shoulders. She feels much better with her powers, but also it's meant to be set up for the post credit scene with her actually helping her father do all the household chores, which he claimed he needed her help with. Like she's literally lifting a bunch of heavy stuff around for him. And also a bit of a reference to the end credits Easter egg here where they have a tribute to the Muscle Beach She-Hulk comic book art with her literally lifting weights. She gets hired by Holloway to the law firm for the superhero division. They explain what's going on with their new job, representing all the supervillains and superheroes. They make a bunch of jokes about everybody else just flipping out at the sight of her. I already explained the Easter egg with all the comic books on the spinner racks in their offices, like how they actually use those to help win their cases. She breaks the fourth wall again to complain about only being hired because she looks the way that she does and breaks the fourth wall again to make another joke about a random answer to a question she didn't hear. What was going on there when she said that she's agnostic was him just asking her about what she thought of the new superhuman law division that they just started and what she thought about actually becoming She-Hulk in general. One of the terms of her accepting the job was Nikki being her paralegal. She's like her best friend. She follows her around to all of her different jobs. You might recognize Josh Chigara as he pokes his head in here as Prometheus from Arrow. He's playing Pug on the show. He's a real character from the comics called Augustus who's just a lawyer who falls in love with her and works at the same law firm. He also debuted in She-Hulk number one. He's mostly a good character in the comics so I don't know if there's anything weird that they have going on with the character during the series or if he's just going to be a character who tries to help her and has like a huge crush on her. He also has a weird poop thing going on too like please poop over in here. This is the good bathroom. They have all the jokes about him giving her the abomination case. She makes all the references to Incredible Hulk like, oh, he tried to kill my cousin, Bruce Banner. The prison that he's at is the same one that Damage Control operates that we saw during the Miss Marvel series that the people have been sent to. The reason why Abomination probably requested her specifically is because he felt like it would help his case. Like obviously there's this long con that it seems like he's playing during the episode and part of it is making everyone believe that he's reformed. Like the Hulk literally says that Abomination sent him a really nice card in one of those funny haikus that he's been creating and they basically buried the hatches so like there's no bad blood between the two of them. But really I think we all believe that there's something really tricky going on with the character like he's just pretending to peddle all this new age bull crap to get out of prison. And he probably requested Jennifer Walters because he felt like it would help that case. The car number here 1202 might be a reference to the Wolverine Hulk team up comic book in 2002. The cell that he's in A113 I think is also meant to be a reference to Avengers 113 which was a Scarlet Witch and Vision story mostly. And I think the idea with these security lasers are that they're built only to stop people with superpowers so they don't affect her while she's in human form. Doesn't totally make sense. I think they're really just there to stop people like the Abomination from getting through. The C31 right next to his cell might be another Thunderbolts, Thunderbolt Ross, Red Hulk comic book Easter egg to Hulk 31. It could also be a reference to the immortal Hulk number 31 as well too. She makes a silence of the land joke quoting the movie serve me up with some fava beans and then a nice Chianti. I also think that's meant to foreshadow him trying to play her because during the actual silence of the lambs movie Hannibal Lecter tries to escape from prison and get free so he can go on a killing spree again. 
in Abomination is really just trying to do whatever he has to to get out of prison. We learn he's been in prison this whole time since the events of Incredible Hulk and in that time he's learned how to change back to human form and it's meant to be this dark parallel for him saying that he got Super Zen with like Hulk getting Super Zen and forming the Professor Banner version of Hulk. The difference with Abomination though I think is that he's just pretending to be good. He basically quotes his entire comic book backstory about how he's Russian, raised in the UK and then on loan to the US military. And when he mentions the Mystery 7 prison pals that he made the past several years that could be a reference to the Thunderbolts characters like he could be writing to people like Val, Baron Zemo, US Agent, the other Thunderbolts related characters. But he also says that those mystery people bought him a piece of land and I think that's going to be paid off in future episodes like where you see him holding this support group here. So some of those mystery people could just be part of like this new age stuff that he's peddling and using that to bilk people of their money and use it to get out of prison. But I think we all believe that he's going to join a future Thunderbolts team like he's going to be their version of a Hulk character on the team. He makes a bunch of references about trying to kill the Hulk in the Incredible Hulk movie like let's address the elephant in the room. The way he plays it though he says that he only went crazy because of the super soldier serum like he blames the serum itself for causing him to do all these things which we know is a lie because the serum just amplifies what you already are like it doesn't change your personality. So I think that's also meant to be a big clue that he's lying about all this. They even kind of play it up as a joke too like he gets way too teary eyed and she's like no 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 you don't need to do that you just need to be authentic when you're talking to the jury. Then like I said they have that big scene where the Hulk makes all the jokes about being recast as Mark Ruffalo later and burying the hatchet with the abomination like oh that movie was so long ago I am completely different person literally. And like I said you can post all your theories in the comments why you think that he's going back to Sakaar. Hulk also literally references the name of the show itself out loud saying she Hulk attorney at law that's the name of the actual show. Then they show the footage of Abomination in the Shang-Chi movie in that underground fight ring with Wong in Macau playing it like it was a prison break and it just happened recently and now because she's his attorney she has to deal with it breaking the fourth wall to complain to us the audience about it. So just to chart the timeline this basically lets you know that the events of the she Hulk series take place like right after the Shang-Chi movie basically. So it's not that long after the events of Avengers Endgame. And I think this is part of the reason why Wong shows up initially like he will help out with the Abomination case because he was spending so much time with him in that underground fight ring. The only extra scenes that they have in the end credits animation from episode 1 are more scenes of her actually joining the G, L, K and H law firm, her, her parents house in She-Hulk form. All these scenes are meant to be taken from the events of the post credit scene where like she's in She-Hulk form helping her parents do household chores. And then they have the actual post credit scene where they pay off the joke from earlier where her father's like oh yeah I have some stuff I need you to help me with where she literally just walks around doing household chores like everybody has to do when they visit their parents like they always have to do common household chores. I'm not sure how many episodes this abomination case is going to take up because it does seem like it's going a little bit of a slower burn. It might just be next week's episode the episode after that and then if abomination comes back it might be later in the series. Because it does sound like she's going to be working on a bunch of different cases through the episodes so like when Daredevil shows up the case that he's working on might be a little bit different because in the Incredible Hulk movie they tore up most of New York City Daredevil is from New York City it could have something to do with that but it could just be a completely different case. If you spotted any other big easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video just write them below in the comments my full She-Hulk episode 3 video will post next week as soon as they release it. I'll do a new She-Hulk episode 3 trailer video tomorrow too. And also because House of the Dragon is back my full House of the Dragon episode 2 video will post on Sunday after that's released. A lot of really cool TV coming from a bunch of different sources really soon. Everyone click here for my House of the Dragon episode 2 trailer video and click here for all my She-Hulk episode videos. Thank you so much for watching everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.